essentially going to be a review of some of the recent federal studies on nursing home quality, safety, and oversight. There's been a, a lot going on. There's been, and we'll talk a little bit about this, you know, there's been a long history of studies on nursing home care, uh, what's going on in facilities, the extent to which nursing homes are accountable for resident care, resident dignity, and resident safety, and meeting those requirements. And what I wanted to do today is to provide a um, kind of review. Uh, we'll, we'll post some of these materials. We already do post a lot of them, but I think we're going to post a list of all of the references and some more that we uh, talk about in today's program on our website so people can have a ready reference to go back to. Uh, the reason for doing this is essentially twofold. One is because I uh, want to inform people about what's out there, what it is, you know, what's going on, what the findings are on the federal level um, by auditors, et cetera, on what is going on in nursing homes. And in addition to informing, excuse me, it's also to help you uh, substantiate. And that's what I do, of course, in our, in our policy work is we use the, this information to substantiate what's going on. So if you are a resident or a family member or an ombudsman or working with residents and families in another capacity, that it's not just you saying, oh, this is going on, this is a concern that we have, et cetera. I mean, I shouldn't say just because it is important, of course, what goes on for individual residents, but the idea of having this, the data that we provide, having the reports, that uh, we'll talk about today and other reports is that it gives you the ability to substantiate, to say it is not quote unquote just me. These are things that are actually going on. These are issues that deserve attention and that need to be addressed. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, I always give a little bit of background. The Long-Term Care Community Coalition, our organization, we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization entirely dedicated to improving care and quality of life for people who are in residential care settings like nursing homes and assisted living, adult homes. Um, it's called different things uh, across our state and in different states. We are also the proud home of the Hudson Valley Long-Term Care Ombudsman Program in New York State. Um, really, really happy and, and proud of the work that we do there. Um, we mostly focus on policy analysis and systemic advocacy, both in our home state of New York and nationally. And in addition, we do education, uh, such as programs like this. We have a lot of materials on our website to educate consumers and families, long-term care ombudsmen, and others who work with them, including, of course, providers and other stakeholders. Uh, a little bit about me, I am an attorney by background. I joined LTCCC in 2002. I just celebrated my 17th anniversary in November, and I've been executive director since 2005. So a uh, brief overview of what we're going to be talking about today. I'm going to provide a brief background on the nursing home system, as I often do in these programs, just to give us um, some sense of what we're talking about and a context. I'm going to talk, as I mentioned before, about some of the recent federal reports on Nursing Home Compare. Most of the ones I'll talk about are from the past year or so, but there's one from a couple of years ago that I think is particularly important that I'll be talking about as well. I'm going to talk a little bit about how Washington has responded to these federal reports, including talking about some congressional hearings that were held this year. It's actually three, not two congressional hearings, two committees, three hearings. Um, a couple of letters to Congress that, that stem from those uh, committee hearings and from people on the Hill uh, in Congress who are concerned about these issues. Uh, just, you know, a couple of small changes that CMS has made the Centers for Medicare Advocacy, excuse me, Centers for, Medi Centers for Medi Medicare and Medicaid Services, I apologize, have made in response to ongoing concerns about nursing home compare. Um, some legislation that recently came out. And then lastly, I'll talk briefly about some of the advocacy that we are doing and that you can do as well. So the nursing home system in a nutshell. Um, virtually every nursing home in the United States uh, is licensed to, uh, or as the government puts it, participates in Medicaid and or Medicare. And that means they take some amount of Medicare or Medicaid money. Usually it's both. The vast majority of nursing homes participate. They take money from Medicaid 
or Medicare. Medicaid pays for most long-term nursing home care in this country, and Medicare pays for most short-term rehab care. And then there's a small amount that's paid for through private insurance or through people's you know, personal savings. In order to participate in Medicare or Medicaid, a facility agrees to meet all the standards provided for in federal law under the nursing home reform law and under federal nursing home regulations. Now, states can have additional protections, but a state cannot have less protections than those provided for under the federal law and federal standards. So, for instance, some states, actually the majority of states now, have a numerical staffing standard for their nursing homes. Uh, our home state of New York is one of the few states that does not have a minimum staffing standard. When I've talked to people over the years uh, who are new to this, either as a family member or as a legislator or as a reporter, um, people are, in my experience, invariably surprised that there is not a numerical standard for having staff in a facility, a certain percentage. And essentially what that means is that nursing homes can take in uh, as many residents as they want, as they have beds for, et cetera, a room for, uh, and there's no specific requirement in the number of staff that they have to have. The federal requirements all talk about having sufficient staff to meet those needs. Uh, and that sounds like it could be meaningful, but actually in practice, in the absence of a numerical requirement, too often uh, sufficient is, is, is just too ambiguous a term to hold providers accountable. So many providers, about 25% or so, do provide sufficient staffing to meet the needs of their residents, but because of the lack of accountability, uh, roughly about 75% of facilities have um, staffing that is below the federal, you know, what, what has been identified in previous federal studies from 2001 approximately as to how much staff time is needed to meet a resident's basic clinical and medical and safety care needs. So uh, that's just, just one example. Uh, and I think, you know, the staffing issue, of course, is important as, as anyone who's been to a nursing home knows. It's, uh, you know, staffing that's key from the the, the um, nurse aides who provide about 90% of the care that residents actually receive to the LPNs and the RNs who provide oversight and monitoring and a, you know have the professional abil ability, excuse me, to um, to ensure that residents are safe, getting appropriate medications, etc. Now, importantly, federal protections are for all residents in the facility, no matter who pays for their care, whether it's Medicare whether it's Medicaid or private pay. And the federal agency, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, they contract with the state agency to ensure that residents are protected and receive services that they need and that they deserve and that are required under federal law. So the, in short, the federal standards really provide the, the, the basis for all the care that goes on in a nursing home uh, states can tweak it in a bit. They can't make it any less than what the federal requirements are, but they can make it a little bit stronger in different ways. Uh, but most of all, you know, most of what we talk about relates to the federal standards because uh, it's those standards that are really key to ensuring that resident care meets, um, you know, meets the standards of care, is safe and is appropriate. And it's the failure to meet those standards on a consistent basis is where we see that residents are harmed, where quality of life is poor, where pressure ulcers develop, where antipsychotic drugs are given unnecessarily, where falls occur, um, etc. A little bit about the reform law, and I'm just going to talk very generally here. We have other materials on our website. We actually have a lot of materials on our website, nursinghome411.org. We talk about it, uh, some specific issues in our programs. So um, you're welcome, of course, to visit. Uh, we're certainly always interested in hearing comments and questions about this. Um, email address is info at ltccc.org. We'll repeat all this later on at the very end for those of you who um, you know to write it down or to copy it 
from the presentation, which will be on our website as well. So the reform law, really the basis for everything we're talking about is from 1987, and it requires that every nursing home resident is provided the care and quality of life services sufficient to attain and maintain his or her highest practicable physical, emotional, and social well-being. And that pretty much is verbatim what the law says. So it's not just ensuring that they have the appropriate clinical care and monitoring, but it also specifically talks about emotional and psychosocial well-being. And it really focuses on the individual. It focuses on care being resident-centered or patient-centered, that the, um, the reform law doesn't, you know, as I, um, you know, often talk about, you know, different, different federal regulations, different state regulations, when they apply to an industry, they apply to what an industry's output is. For instance, the car industry, the automobile industry, you know, GM or Chevrolet or, or uh, Chevrolet Fiat, whatever, they are, you know, they have to have a certain amount of uh, requirements for miles per gallon across their fleet. So it's based upon what they're putting out. The nursing home reform law provides for very different expectations when it comes to nursing home care. As you know, we're noting here, it has to be based upon the individual. It has to be based upon the highest practicable for that resident, what he or she is able to achieve physically, uh, emotionally, and socially. So you know, people shouldn't be isolated. If people are able to walk, they should be able to continue to be able to walk, to have that capacity while they're in the nursing home to receive occupational therapy services or other therapy services to enable them to maintain their, their highest functioning. Um, the law passed in 1987 and the regulatory standards came out in 1991. Those regulatory standards were in place until 2016 for 25 years. They were revised under the Obama administration they, um, the revisions were substantial in that they encompassed all of the requirements. I mean, keep in mind that they had not been changed for 25 years uh, substantially. So those requirements were updated in 2016, but the, require, the changes, excuse me, in 2016 were not substantive, meaning that the reform law, everything that we're talking about here, that those things, the basis of the requirements, did not change. The residents' rights did not change in 2016. What really happened in 2016, in short, is that over the years, over the 25 years, we've come to have a better understanding of what it means to be an aging individual, what it means to be someone who has disabilities, what it means to be someone who is living with Alzheimer's or other dementia. So the new regulations really reflected how are we getting to individualized patient-centered care. How, what, what does it mean to have your highest practicable well-being when you're someone living, for instance, with dementia? Uh, so those were what those revisions in 2016. Those revisions, by the way, are still being implemented, so I'm sure we'll talk about that more in future programs. The main body of those regulations, the implementation um, that came out in 2016 went into effect immediately. Some additional ones went into effect in 2017. And the last few actually just went into effect in November of 2019, just last month. And the guidelines, the, the sort of the explanation of what those standards are, actually have not even been issued yet. I don't want to get too much into the weeds on some of these things because we could spend an hour or more just talking about that. But just to give you a sense of, in 2016, the regulations were revised, and those revisions are now in the process of being implemented. Um, Unfortunately, from our point of view, the, when the Trump administration came in, and again, we're not a partisan organization, but the administration came in, and as they've been doing with the environment and other issues, they have been uh, deregulating industries. And that's what they are doing in respect to the nursing home industry. We've already seen that happen with some smaller bits related to um, the right to, to go to court if you um, are abused or neglected. They've taken that right away in, by saying that a facility can require pre-dispute arbitration agreements. Uh, however, uh, just a couple months ago, the administration uh, also proposed sweeping new revisions to the six, 2016 regulations to reduce regulatory burdens. So they've been proposed 
They are not in place yet. It is something that we are, of course, monitoring. Uh, if you are interested in that, please do check on our website or join our um, listserv or join our, you know, us, our alert list, excuse me, and we will be happy to let you know. But that's just the sense of what's going on. Again, regulations went into effect in 1991, the um, revised in 2016, and now they are in the process of being revised again. And the reason why some of this is, you know, why, why I want to spend a couple of minutes just talking about that is that's what makes some of the issues we're going to talk about today so important is that we are still, you know, we know that nursing home care, uh, that it is problematic to say the least for a lot of residents and for a lot of families, what they see, uh, what they encounter when they go to a nursing home and that it's important that we be aware and that we advocate and we have this information that we're going to talk about today to help us substantiate when we do have concerns, when we do encounter resident abuse or neglect. I'm going to skip over this slide and go right into some of the reports that we are going to be talking about today. So, as I was just saying, uh, to address, you know, some long-standing concerns about quality and safety of nursing home care in all of our states and really in all of our communities, uh, as well as not, not, not only, so to speak, quality and safety, but also to look at the integrity of the public funds. As I mentioned before, the vast majority of care, nursing home care in this country is paid for by the public through Medicare and or Medicaid. So the public, even if you don't have a family member in a nursing home, even if you yourself are not in a nursing home, you have an interest in the many billions of dollars a year that are spent on nursing home care to make sure that those that money is not wasted, that it actually goes to pay for care, and that that care meets uh, you know, a basic professional standards. Uh, for all those reasons, there have been many, many assessments over the years in nursing home um, care. There have been federal um, studies by the Government Accountability Office and the Office of the Inspector General of the Department of Health and Human Services. Those two offices have been two key agencies that really have provided oversight of, uh, not oversight, but really look to see the extent uh, to which nursing home residents are protected and that the monies that we pay for their care are used appropriately. Uh, in addition, there have been numerous uh, academic research efforts over the years looking at nursing home care, looking at the quality of care, looking at outcomes, identifying appropriate care practices um, as professionals, which nursing homes, of course, are supposed to be. Uh, CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid uh, Services itself has undertaken studies those are generally done through contractors. Um, certain news media outlets, excuse me, have conducted in-depth research on nursing home care, nursing home quality. Um, most recently, both ProPublica and Fair Warning have conducted some really interesting and useful research on what is going on in nursing homes and other residential care settings. And then, of course, nonprofit organizations. We do a lot of research on what's going on with nursing home residents, what's going on in terms of quality of care, how are the standards being met or not for residents. The Human Rights Watch came out with a really important report, uh, I think it was about a year and a half ago now, that looked at the extent to which nursing home residents are being given drugs, antipsychotic drugs, inappropriately, um, essentially as a way to sedate them and to make them easier to care for for facility staff. It's an ongoing issue for us and for the other organizations I mentioned here, Center for Medicare Advocacy and the National Consumer Voice, have both published really important reports looking to see, well, what is going on when there is appropriate, inappropriate care, excuse me, when standards are not being met, how is that being addressed? And what are the repercussions? What is the impact uh, for residents? So for instance, the center does a lot of, of really important work looking at enforcement uh, and too often, unfortunately, the lack of enforcement of minimum standards, similar to what we do at LTCCC. The, the National Consumer Voice has done some really exceptional work looking at the impact of the, um, when there is uh, inadequate care or inappropriate care um, uh, or abuse and neglect on residents. And they had a piece called The Faces of Neglect a couple of years ago that is um, really remarkable. Today, though, we're going to focus on some of those federal accountability agencies, a few of those GAO and OIG reports that I think are important. And again, the purpose of this, I mean, the, those, those agencies, 
they are really, in essence, accounting agencies. I mean, they are not the way you know some other reporting would might look at more quality of life or more of the impacts um, in terms of how uh, you know uh, uh, the impacts in terms of how residents are affected. Uh, how their quality of life is affected, how falls impact them, how pressure ulcers impact them, et cetera. For instance, as I mentioned just a moment ago, the Human Rights Watch and uh, report that talked to people in nursing homes across the country and said, you know, this is the impact of the overuse of antipsychotic drugs. What these accountability agencies do is they really purely look at the data and they are extremely conservative about the findings that they make. So as we'll talk about it, to me, what's really important and what's really useful there is that they are finding by the most conservative means of looking possible um, that there is a uh, tremendous need to improve care, to improve safety, and to improve oversight. And again, you know, what part of what I want to do today is to inform you as to you know, what some of these findings are, but also to help you um, do what I do is I use these studies to substantiate concerns that we have. Again, when we hear about, you know, when we talk to ombudsmen and they have issues, they say, well, these are issues that are going on. These are issues that have been identified by the GAO or the OIG, and that's really important. For all these reports, I'm going to include here, as you can see at the bottom, a link to the, um, to the actual report so you can find out more information. But we also, as I mentioned earlier, we will um, post a, um, just a listing of these and other reports that uh, can be useful for your reference in the future. And this uh, program is up, it's up on the wall right now if you enter through godaddy.com's wall, excuse me, through the free conference call.com wall. Uh, otherwise, we also will post it by the end of the day on our website. The uh, recording of this webinar will be made available by the end of the week, and we will be posting it as a podcast as well, um, I think, by the end of the week. So without further ado, the first GEO report I want to talk about um, was uh, entitled Better Oversight Needed to Protect Residents from Abuse. And this, all, everything in italics here, which is uh, everything but the one line that's underlined, comes directly from what GAO said, because I want you to have the information that is directly from GAO, not just what my opinion is or my take on it is. GAO said nursing home residents often have physical or cognitive limitations that can leave them particularly vulnerable to abuse. They also note that abuse of nursing home residents can occur in many forms, physical abuse, mental abuse, verbal abuse, and sexual abuse. And those, those abuses can be committed by staff, they can be committed by residents or others, you know, visitors, um, uh, contract staff, et cetera, people who are coming in the nursing home. So it's really important, again, nursing homes have the responsibility for having a safe environment. Nursing homes have the responsibility for hiring people who can provide safe care who are not going to be abusive, who don't have a record of abuse, who, uh, and, and to make sure that they do the appropriate, not only you know, checking backgrounds, um, but that they are also monitoring people to make sure that care is appropriate and that residents are free from abuse and neglect. Uh, and lastly, you know, the third um, point here that I wanted to make from the GEO report is that they know any incident of abuse is a serious occurrence and can result in potentially devastating consequences for residents including lasting mental anguish, serious injury, or death. And I think this is so important because too often what we see in, you know, we do a joint newsletter with the Center for Medicare Advocacy, it comes out every, every month, called um, the Elder Justice Newsletter, um, and it talks about, you know, so-called no-harm deficiencies, where there was substandard care or another problem was found, but no harm was identified by the surveyor. And what J.O. is saying here is that that pretty much should never happen. Any incidence of abuse is a serious occurrence and can result in potentially devastating consequences for residents. Um, and that is true, as CMS says over and over again in its rules and in its guidance about the rules for facilities, for state surveyors, for ombudsmen and for, for advocates, you know, and, and, and everyone who is concerned about this, is that you know, if a resident has dementia, the resident doesn't realize, perhaps, or, or is not believed to realize 
that he or she has been abused, that doesn't matter. That is not the point. If there is abuse, it is should be it should be treated as being serious, and it should be understood as being, you know, as having negative consequences for that individual. <clears throat> so, why did, why is this going on? What C, what GAO did was they identified what they call oversight gaps. Um, they said that information on abuse and perpetrator types is not readily available. So again, again, we have this absence of information, absence of monitoring, absence of understanding what is going on in terms of the, you know, when residents experience abuse. Um, there is an absence or lack of facility reported incidents. They lack key information. So even when facilities report that there's an incident, oftentimes the information is not there. And lastly, they identify that gaps exist in the CMS process for the state survey agency, the Department of Health, to uh, make referrals to law enforcement. And this is, this is so important. I mean, from our perspective, the reasons why abuse and neglect and crimes against residents, the, the reasons why they persist to the extent that they do is because there is the lack of understanding that has existed, that, that abuse or neglect has happened, um, and then just a, a lack of Either it just doesn't happen uh, for various reasons, as noted here, that the facilities or whoever the witnesses are reporting it appropriately, and that people are bringing in uh, adult protective services, bringing in law enforcement, et cetera, in an effective way to address that abuse. The OIG also had a, a recent report that found and this is the title, Incidents of Potential Abuse and Neglect at Skilled Nursing Facilities, Nursing Homes, Were Not Always Reported and Investigated. And they found, they looked at actually hospital ER uh, admissions from nursing homes. And they found that one out of five of the high-risk hospital Medicare claims for treatment coming from a facility included a injury or a potential abuse or neglect and they were not reported. Uh, or the that many of these incidents, excuse me, were not reported. As they know here, nursing homes failed to report many of these incidents to the survey agencies in accordance with applicable federal requirements. And in turn, or in addition, I should say, the state survey agencies, the departments of health, the Department of Public Health, et cetera, failed to report some of these findings of substantiated abuse to law enforcement as is required. So the OIG recommended they said one action is needed to ensure that incidents of potential abuse or neglect are both identified and reported. And they recommended essentially two actions. One, nursing home staff must be better trained to identify when resident abuse and neglect has occurred. Uh, and I would add to that that the training should include uh, better monitoring skills. And two, they also said, and this is a quote, requiring the survey agencies to record and track all incidents of potential abuse or neglect in nursing homes and referrals made to local law enforcement and other agencies. Because what they found here was, you know, again, getting back to the initial findings that, you know, one out of five people who came into a hospital for, for a Medicare nursing home stay, for, um, excuse me, came into the ER, that there was the likelihood of potential abuse or neglect. And there was, they found a serious lack of reporting. When they went back and they examined these records, they found that there quite often was not any reporting as should have happened, as is required to happen under the federal requirements to the state survey agency, to local law enforcement. Those are all requirements. This is something we hear about, you know, over and over again. Does the facility staff have a, a, um, an obligation to report? Yes. Do other people at the nursing home have an obligation to report abuse and neglect? Yes. Um, do you have an a, a obligation to report a suspicion of a crime against a resident? Yes. Those are really important standards. Why? Because too often, as, as I'm sure all of you know, nursing home residents are, don't have the capacity or don't have the ability or the resources to report themselves. As the GAO noted in the report I mentioned earlier, nursing home residents are typically very vulnerable. Uh, 
And because they rely on nursing homes for a 24-hour day, skilled nursing care, monitoring, and oversight, um, they are basically, um, you know, very easy, unfortunately, victims for abuse and neglect. And that's why these protections exist. But if they're not being reported, if these, if these safeguards are not being utilized, then abuse and neglect will persist. I'm going to talk a little bit, some of the, a couple, take a couple of our next reports, uh, focus more on quality of care and deficiencies. So this is a, a US OIG re, um, report. They found that, well, the title is, excuse me, trends and deficiencies at nursing homes show that improvements are needed to ensure the health and safety of residents. And I think some of these reports are, you know, I wanted to first talk about a couple of reports regarding abuse and neglect, as we just did. But I also wanted to focus on some of the reports that look at um, deficiencies, uh, look at uh, substandard care, because as I mentioned at the start of this program, you know, too often people are told that, oh, you know, too often people are told that they should accept what they're getting and that this is part and parcel of nursing home care. And in fact, as we talk about in many of our programs and much of our work, nursing home residents have a right to a high quality of care, as we talked about before in regards to the nursing home reform law. So why is there a disconnect between what the residents are entitled to under federal law, what nursing homes are paid to provide under federal law, and so much of what we as individual, individuals, excuse me, are experiencing. And here again, the purpose of talking about these reports is to help you both understand that these are systemic problems, that you do indeed have a right to, to more, and to help you substantiate that this is not just your opinion, this is not what you think about what your rights are, that these are things that are going on um, and that need to be addressed, in, in generally in our nursing homes and of course in the nursing homes in our communities and in our states. So what um, OIG did was that they, uh, they looked at, they assessed nursing home deficiencies, you know, citations um, from across the country for four years, 2013 through 2017. They found that the number of surveys and deficiencies uh, increased a little bit by bit from 2013 through, through 2016, and then there was a slight decrease in 2017. So probably, frankly, not enough to say you know, clearly that there's a trend here, but this finding is concerning because, as I mentioned before, the Trump administration, which came in um, you know, around the, the time that we're seeing the decrease, um, they were, have been working to alleviate provider burden. They've been working to reduce the amount of fines and to reduce the frequency of fines. So it's something that just, you know, we should all be, be aware of. They found that 94% um, of all deficiencies had a less serious rating, generally speaking, meaning that resident harm was not identified, and 6% of deficiencies had a more serious rating, which harm or immediate jeopardy to residents' well-being um, were identified. That corroborates with the research that we've done. We do a lot of research. We just came out with data last week um, on the most recent citations across the country. This is from actually 2000, I think, um, 16 or 17 through uh, August of 2019 uh, that we downloaded. It's on our website, nursinghome411.org. All of the citations against nursing homes for every single licensed nursing home in the country. So you can get that, that those data right now. Um, we divide them up into state files, so you can look at your state file, you can search by city, et cetera. But you can see, and what our data has shown, is that roughly about 95% is what, is what we've seen of all deficiencies, all healthcare deficiencies, are ranked as not causing any resident harm, and about 4.5% or so are identified as having caused resident harm. We typically, by the way, disagree with that. As I mentioned before, we do a monthly newsletter in, in collaboration with the Center for Medicare Advocacy, the Elder Justice No Harm Newsletter, where you'll see that many of these deficiencies, I think a reasonable person, even though the surveyor said there was no harm, I think a reasonable person would identify harm. And that's a big issue for us as advocates, is the identification of harm when a facility is cited. Um, 
Last thing, I thought this was interesting also in terms of this report, the OIG found that about 31% of nursing homes had a repeat deficiency. When they, they re refer to that as a deficiency type or category that was cited at least five times for that nursing home in separate surveys. They found that most of these were for uh, the following two, the following categories, excuse me. Uh, one, ensuring that nursing homes are free of accident hazards, that they provide adequate supervision of residents and provide adequate assistance devices for residents. And two, that they are providing care and services for the highest well-being of residents. So just to reiterate, they found that about 31% of nursing homes had repeat deficiencies and that most of these were for these categories, free from accident hazards and um, providing adequate supervision of residents and then also providing care and services for the highest well-being of residents. So those were, you know, it's a way for us to identify and address and to go back to what I was just mentioning a moment ago, if you look at the data that I was just talking about that we have on our website on the citations, you could see if you're working with residents in your nursing home or if you're looking at what's going on in your community or in your state, what some of those citations were. What's going on there? Has the facility, if you're working with residents or if you're a family member, if you're a resident yourself, uh, if your facility was cited, what have they done to correct that citation? What have they done to address the issues that were identified? If they were cited numerous times, well, that should be a cause for alarm. Why do they not correct those violations as they're required to do in a meaningful enough way to ensure that they do not reoccur? By the way, before I move on, I'm going to just go back to that slide. Um, we did some, some research and we published some data in the past that looked at what we call chronic deficiencies. Essentially, that's, um, and this comes from the Coalition for Quality Care and uh, Kate Ricks from Voices for Quality Care actually recommended this several years ago that um, to identify nursing homes that have, a, just as the OIG is saying here, repeat deficiencies over and over again. So we have some data from 2016, 17, I think, that looked at the last three years of, uh, and this is on our website, the last three years at that time of deficiencies, and we identified facilities that had what we call chronic deficiencies, meaning they had the, the same citation, um, citation, excuse me, for the same deficiency type three or more times in the three years of nursing home compare. And we found that about 42% of facilities nationwide had that. And again, it's a cause for concern because if you get a deficiency, you are required as a nursing home to correct that deficiency and not just correct it for the individual or individuals affected, but correct it in a way to ensure that it doesn't happen again. And that's why these repeat deficiencies are of such great concern and so alarming and so alarming that they happen in, um, as OIG is saying, about 30% 30, 30 of facilities. Next report I wanted to talk about is the um, another OIG report. This was a review they did of nine state practices, and it's called CMS Guidance to State Survey Agencies on Verifying Correction of Deficiencies Needs to be Improved to Help Ensure the Health and Safety of Nursing Home Residents. Exactly what I was just saying, that we need to make sure, when, when as you all know, I'm sure, um, surveyors only go into a nursing home about once a year um, and they're there for generally less than a week. It is not the job of the state survey agency to ensure that nursing homes are meeting federal standards for four days out of the year. It is the job of the state agency to ensure that nursing home residents are protected 24 hours a day, seven, seven days a week, 52 weeks out of the year. They do that in part by having that, that once a year survey. They're supposed to be doing that in part by uh, responding to resident and others' complaints, including complaints from facilities uh, or, or alerts that they get from facilities. What I mentioned earlier on about when there's a abuse or neglect, facilities themselves are required to report that. The state agency is required to investigate and to cite if necessary and to make sure that the citation is corrected. So we have, you know, again, just to, to take a step back, we have ongoing issues in nursing homes. These are not things that are just in our head or things that we're just, you know, seeing here and there. They are persistent and widespread problems 
that, as we see in these reports, are being identified by auditing agencies, people that are really looking very conservatively at the data and finding that, as I note here on this slide in bold, they, based upon their review of nine states, they found that seven of those states, 78% of their, of their pool, did not always verify that nursing homes corrected the deficiencies as required. Specifically, as I note in the second bullet here, for almost half of the deficiencies that they sampled, and this is a quote, state agencies did not obtain evidence of nursing homes' correction of deficiencies or maintain sufficient evidence that they had verified correction of deficiencies. Uh, for the less serious deficiencies, the practice of six of the seven states was to just accept a nursing home's correction plan as confirmation of substantial compliance with federal requirements. They did not obtain from the nursing home any evidence that the nursing home had actually corrected the deficiency. So I know this is a lot of information for people, and again, the link is here, but I, what, I want to, to, what I want to take away for you to be here, please, is that when, again, you know, the state agencies and CMS, they have complete responsibility for ensuring that nursing homes are taking care of residents, that they are meeting federal requirements for the stand quality of care, for quality of life, and for basic safety. And they do that by citing a facility, by giving a facility a deficiency when they find there's a problem. It is incumbent upon the states. It is so important that they make sure that the facility has actually implemented a correction to its problem. And it's not just, again, a correction that Ms. Jones is no longer getting the, the wrong medication. It's that if there is a medication issue for Ms. Jones, that that facility has actually implemented system-wide corrections to make sure that no one else is going to have a medication error. That is it's just an example, but again, it's to make sure that residents are safe. Nursing homes are paid a lot of money every single day to provide good care that meets professional standards, good oversight, 24-hour day, professional monitoring, etc. Um, the fact that they're allowed to just say that they corrected the deficiency without having to provide per further proof or further verification is very, very alarming. Next study I want to talk about, and I think this is our, our last one in terms of the federal studies. This to me, it's from, a little, it's from actually 2014. The other studies are from the last year or so. But this was one of the most, uh, I think, shocking studies that I've encountered in my professional work at, at the coalition. And this was an OIG study. Um, they found that it was called Adverse Events in Skilled Nursing Facilities the national incidence among Medicare beneficiaries. And what this only looked at people who were in nursing homes for Medicare short-term rehab. It did not look at people who were in there for long-term care, uh, most of whom have dementia, many of whom are, most of whom are extremely vulnerable and rely on a nursing home for their care day in and day out for days, months, and years. This was short-term resident, you know, short-term care, people who were there for rehab, expecting to get out of the facility. And what the OIG found was that one out of three of these residents were harmed. That, that was just uh, really, I think, one of the most, as I said before, one of the most explosive findings that I've ever seen in my career. They found that almost 60% of the injuries that resident, these, these short-term residents suffered were preventable and attributable to poor care. They found that much of the preventable harm was due to substandard treatment, inadequate resident monitoring, and a failure to provide care or delay to provide necessary care. As a result, in addition to one out of three of these people being harmed, 6% of those who were harmed died, more than half of them were rehospitalized, and this cost, so this was a 2014 report, Look at 2011 data. Um, they found that it would cost the public um, 2.8 $2 billion dollars in 2011 alone. That was eight years ago. So you can imagine what that is now. Again, this is just for short-term rehab. Can you imagine 
what goes on for people there who have dementia, people there who, who depend upon a nursing home every single day for their lives' care. Um, it was a, a real wake-up call, even to me, even to someone who looks at, at you know, deficiencies, even someone who looks at you know, what is going on in a nursing home, hears from people about poor care, to think that one out of three residents in nursing homes are being harmed. And, and I discussed this at a meeting um, that we had shortly after, uh, after the report came out, and I still remember one of, one of my board members said, she is a former nurse in a nursing home, she said, those are the residents who can talk. Those are the residents who are expecting to get out, who can identify, hey, this isn't my right medicine, or hey, someone was supposed to come and give me physical therapy. Can we imagine what goes on for the majority of long-term care residents who have uh, Alzheimer's or some other kind of dementia? Um, the residents who depend upon the facility for everything. What is going on with them? This did not even include them. How, what percentage of those residents are harmed as a result of, that, of, of poor care uh, as a result of inadequate monitoring, et cetera. So those are some of the federal studies I wanted to um, wanted to highlight in today's program. As I said before, this will be posted on our website this afternoon, so you can see what the links are if you've missed them here uh, or if you're listening to the podcast. And we will also uh, put together a list of, of just a general list of resources for federal reports again because it's helpful to those to go back to, it's helpful to you to go back to in the future, or it could be useful to substantiate some of the issues that you're seeing. So in the remaining time, I want to talk about some of the um, responses that we've seen on Capitol Hill in Congress and by CMS, and then just briefly talk about some of the advocacy that we are doing and that you yourself can do. So in, this is just for this year. There were two Senate finance hearings uh, earlier this year, one was called Not Forgotten, Protecting Americans from Abuse and Neglect in Nursing Homes. And the second one was called Promoting Elder Justice, A Call for Reform. Those are both available if you do a search for uh, Senate Finance Hearing uh, Nursing Home. You could find either one of those. And there was a hearing uh, about a month ago in the House uh, Ways and Means Committee called Caring for Aging Americans that also looked at not just nursing home care, but it looked at uh, dementia care, looked at hospice care, et cetera. And I, both of these hearings, people identified some of this, the, the systemic issues that are going on, some of the individual issues that are going on for people and for families who are faced with needing nursing home or other care. And too often what they find as a result, which is just um, substandard, which can lead to or result in abuse and neglect. Um, there have also been a number of letters. Now, what will happen is that when people in Congress, when they hear from us, when they hear from us as advocacy organizations, when they hear from, from individuals, from families, from ombudsmen, from residents, uh, you know, when a senator hears that, when a someone, someone in the House of Representatives hears that, when they hear enough of it, you know, it can raise concern and they can send you know, letters to CMS, as I note here in the last bullet, the House Ways and Means Chair, um, Richard Neal, he sent a letter to CMS in regard to continued concerns about the overuse of antipsychotic drugs in nursing homes. It's an issue, as those of you who follow work know, it's something that, that we've been doing a lot of work around and are very concerned about, that, that hundreds of thousands of residents receive powerful and dangerous antipsychotic drugs every day. And a significant amount of that is unnecessary and is dangerous. Uh, the Senate Finance Chair, um, Charles Grassley, he was the one who called the Senate Finance hearings. He wrote an op-ed recently in the Des Moines Register, oversight is necessary to ensure quality of care in nursing homes. So it's important to alert, as I'll mention in, in the next, um, excuse me, I'm gonna skip ahead actually, I take that back. I'm not going to skip ahead. <laughs> uh, as I'll mention later on in some of the advocacy that we're doing, that you can do, letting these people know that these issues are important makes a significant difference. Too often I talk to families and I talk to, to ombudsmen and to residents and they feel like, well, it doesn't make a difference to, to file a complaint. It doesn't make a difference to make a phone call. But I think a call, especially a, uh, a, a letter, uh, even an email, to, to your congressperson, to your senator, 
to your state legislator, to the governor, makes a difference. It makes them aware that people care about this. And if they hear that people care about it, they will care about it, and they themselves will take action. So I apologize for skipping ahead there. Um, I just wanted to quickly mention that CMS made a change, just went into effect uh, towards the end of October. That's the, C the Nursing Home Compare website. It's medicare.gov, Nursing Home Compare, which has information on every single licensed nursing home in the country. They now display an alert icon, a basically a stop sign to alert people when a facility has been found to have abuse that led to resident harm within the past year or where there was in a citation for potential um, resident harm um, in the last two years. So that's important. It's, it's not stopping that harm. It's not doing some of the things that the OIG and the GAO and we and others have called for CMS and for the states to do year after year after year, but it is a step in the right direction by alerting the public, by saying that th these things are not acceptable, by helping people to be aware of what's going on in nursing homes in their community and to make choices based upon, uh, upon that awareness. There's also a bill that just came out a couple weeks ago. It's called the Bill to Improve Quality of Care and Nursing Homes. It was introduced by Representative Shakovsky and Senator Blumenthal, so the bicameral bill. Uh, the bill would establish minimum numerical nursing homes uh, staffing standards for nursing homes uh, under Medicare and Medicaid, every licensed nursing home. Uh, essentially, it requires or would require 4.1 hours of direct care staff time per resident per day. That is based upon a 2001 federal study that found that below that amount, there is an increased likelihood of residents um, deteriorating of residents experiencing harm, et cetera. That study, by the way, did not get at what is needed to provide good care to ensure that residents have the um, uh, services, services that they need for recreation, that social work care uh, didn't get to um, you know, quality of life. It really only talked about the clinical care needed to, or, or you know, the, the care needed to avoid poor clinical outcomes, et cetera. So 4.1 hours is what the minimum staffing level would be required by this bill. It expands training requirements and supervision for all nursing home staff. It creates whistleblower protections for those who report abuse and neglect. Again, getting at you know with the OIG and GEO reports that we were talking about earlier today. It, and this is really important. It prohibits the use of forced arbitration agreements between residents and any nursing home entity. In the 2016 federal regulations, they eliminated uh, the facility's ability to put a pre-dispute arbitration agreement uh, in a nursing home residency agreement. Don't want to get into it here, but we have information on arbitration agreements on our website. But essentially, this is something that we have been very, very concerned about, that nursing homes in their in, in their residency agreement will put in a clause saying that you agree to to resolve any future dispute, no matter what it is, abuse, neglect, wrongful death, um, because of inadequate care, or, you know, allegations of abuse, etc. No matter what it is, you agree to go to arbitration rather than ever suing us. And we think that is, frankly, disastrous for residents and unfair. People may want or choose to go to arbitration when they have, uh, when they're faced with one of those situations and they have those choices before them, but to take away um, that choice at the very beginning by requiring them to sign a forced arbitration agreement to us is untenable under the U.S. Constitution. This, um, that was prohibited under the 2016 regulations, unfortunately, in 2017, 18, when um, President Trump and the new administration came in, they reduced, they removed that, that agreement. That went into effect as of this past summer. So as of now, facilities can require, or excuse me, not require, but they can put in a arbitration um, clause into their residency agreements. This bill would prohibit that. So I hope that was clear, because there's been a lot, a lot back and forth on that issue. And lastly, it would develop a standardized protocol for nursing homes to use to, to obtain written informed consent from residents or from their representatives 
for the use of psychotropic drugs, including antipsychotics. And we think that is extremely important. It's one of our, our biggest advocacy um, the biggest advocacy concerns both the state and federal level. I know we've gone a little bit over time, and I apologize for that. I'm just going to wrap this up. And I'm sorry we got a late start today. We have an action alert center on our website. It says nursinghome411.org, and you can see on the left-hand side there is um, uh, something called the action center. You click there. We have state action alerts for people in our state. We have national action alerts that can be used nationwide. Uh, because that bill that I just mentioned is brand new, we are in the process of developing an action alert on it that will go out at the end of this week. So if you visit this site um, Friday afternoon at the latest, you will see that we will have an action alert to let your congressperson, to let your senator, and to let the president know that you support the safe staffing bill on the federal level. In addition, you could also contact on your own. You don't have to go through our website. You can, you know, we strongly encourage you, as I've said a number of times in this program, to contact your state and federal representatives. Let them know that you're concerned. It doesn't have to be anything specific, but it can be if you, if you had an experience. But also let them know. Let them know from, you know, based upon some of these reports that we're seeing, it's not a specific issue that you might be facing, that these are systemic and they deserve a response at the highest level. They deserve a response from our policy leaders. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, please, you're welcome to join us, Nursing Home 411, forward slash join, um, to receive future alerts about what's going on with these rules, what's going on with these bills, uh, for future you know, things that we are concerned about, action alerts, et cetera. You can join us at Facebook, facebook.com forward slash LTCCC. Uh, follow us on Twitter, twitter.com forward slash LTC consumer. As I mentioned before, this program will be up on our website today, nursinghome411.org, uh, as will the uh, recording by the end of the week, and the as well as the podcast now, so you could listen to this. Um, thank you very much for Ombudsman in New York State. We, uh, you're welcome to take a survey, uh, surveymonkey.com. You can see the link uh, is on available on our website. And for family members in New York State, we strongly uh, encourage you to join the Alliance of New York Family Councils. It's a great group, which we strongly support, www.anyfc.org. And anyone who has questions about family councils or is looking for resources, et cetera, it's something that we really want to do as much as we can to support. Send us an email, info at lt, as in Tom, ccc.org. I'm going to open up to any questions. Our next program will be January 21st at 1 p.m. Eastern. It's, I think, going to be really interesting. We, we're going to be coming out with a new report assessing the humanity of nursing home care, uh, a special report from the Long-Term Care Community Coalition. We are working on that now, and I think it's, it's a, a, a really striking report. So I hope you'll join us. In the meantime, uh, wishing you all a happy holiday season and, uh, and a happy and a healthy 2020. We look forward to speaking to you then. I'm going to open it up to any questions, hopefully. And um, Sarah, if you can, let me see. Actually, I think I could see the chat here. So I'm going to open, look and see if there's any questions, then I'll open it up. Uh, some Sarah, we can't see her in anything. Oh, goodness. Okay. I did uh, not see any questions, Richard. Okay, the... great. Great. But people, you, okay. Any questions? Now you can you can open up your line by pressing star six, or the microphone on the bottom left of your screen. Oh, thanks, Sarah. Okay, well I wish you all a very happy new year. If you have any questions or comments, we certainly welcome them. Info at ltccc.org. Wishing you all, uh, you know, thank you all for your interest and for your advocacy and support of residents. And I wish you all, again, a happy and a uh, healthy 2012. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Same to you, Richard. Oh. It's Sarah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.